like I'm not going to argue with you because <laughs> the, the thing is, again, what you're experiencing is the result of your cognitive process that leads you to think there are two different people, right? There are two different personas. Hi there, welcome to another episode of Chinatown 2.0, a show about Chinese immigrants arriving. I'm your host, Richard Yan. Today, I'm interviewing Bruce Wong. He is a Chinese cowboy. Not an ethnically Chinese person that was born in Texas, but someone born and bred in Yunnan, China. He came to the US as a college student and eventually adopted a Southern accent. He started dressing like a cowboy and making videos about how cowboys spend their time. We talked about why he decided to become a cowboy, why he felt the cowboy culture reminded him of his hometown of Kunming, how he felt different when speaking a different language, how he dealt with an identity crisis, whether he has encountered acts of racism and racial ignorance, his plans to dedicate his PhD to the intersection of languages and cross-cultural understanding, and more. I hope you enjoy listening to this episode. If you like the content and want to support this show, the best way to do so is to like, subscribe, and ring the bell for notification. The YouTube algorithm will take such actions into account and help this show reach more people. Thank you. Bruce, it's nice to have you on Chinatown 2.0. Welcome. Oh, I'm glad to be here too. Awesome. Perfect. Perfect. So why don't we get started with your background? Just tell us a little bit about who you are, how, what identity you identify with the most at the moment. Oh, okay. Well, conventionally, conventionally of say how people define an individual, they to say, you know, I was made in China and more specifically Southwest China. I came from a city it's called Kunming. Yes. It's located in Yunnan. And it's actually the capital city of the province. And I came to the States almost like, man, like 10 years ago. Okay. So when you were 15, 16 years when old? I was like 20. So this 20 year I'll be turning this year I'll be turning 30. So I, I'm old. I oh, okay. Am old. Okay, well careful there, cowboy. <laughs> but uh Oh, that's great. That's great. Well, it's obvious to the listeners and the viewers that you have a Southern accent. And in fact, the reason why I reached out is because I find your story quite unique. So maybe tell us a little bit about how you became a cowboy. How I became a cowboy? Well, first of all, I learned the accent first, but then I was thinking, well, having the accent doesn't have the consistency, say, of the identity of a Southerner here in the Southern parts of the United States. Right, you're so in Texas was, right now, right? Right, right. Yeah. So like I was thinking about ways to kind of enhance this consistency of identity with the accent. So at the time I really liked Doug Dynasty. Yes. But then I was thinking, well, what if someday, you know, I, I will have to leave the States? And for Duck Dynasties, they were just a bunch of rednecks shooting ducks, and you have to have guns to do that. I mean, for, for most cases, I, <clears throat> right. but you have to have guns to do that. But there are very few countries on this planet that would allow gun ownership. So from that point, I was thinking, well, there are a lot of cows over here in Texas, and cowboys are, they're big over here, right? So with that thinking, I started to approach people who are in the cattle industry around here, more specifically like West Texas, where I am. So I started to go around with the camera, taking pictures of cowboys and cattle, that kind of stuff. Yeah. And also expressed my interest for working in the industry. So after some time, because it takes time to, to build relationships and, and trust with whoever you're trying to communicate with. Okay. So, uh, Are you taking pictures of these people mostly for building up a portfolio of artworks? Is it uh, for the purpose of your media company? I, initially, what, what I was trying to do was say, help build a channel 
of say beef export to China. And that was back in 2017. Yeah, that was back in 2017 when, you know, the US beef was banned in China for probably like 17 years. And then- I didn't know that. Yeah, because, well, because of the mad cow disease, right? Well, actually 14 years, 14 years, because in 2003, the mad cow disease, there, there were a few cases over here in the States and China freaked out. So yeah. then China banned imports of U.S. beef. Yeah. And at that time, well, China wasn't buying a lot. Like right now, China is like the number one beef importer. But back then, China wasn't buying a lot. Still, U.S. had a large share of market in terms of imported beef in China at that time. But okay. then that cow disease came. So the government over there just, just you know, banned the importation of U.S. beef until Trump became president and the, okay. the ban was lifted. But then, I mean, you're probably more aware of the issue than I am. You know, the trade war happened and I think it kind of backfired on this gate, which just opened for beef exports. So like, okay. uh, so that kind of didn't work out, but then one of my bosses, right? Like he saw that I wanted to be a cowboy. So usually like during winter time, he would have more calves coming from Mexico because the cattle industry here in the States is highly integrated with the cattle industry in Mexico here in the South and with Canada up, up there in the North. So like he would have a lot of like new winged calves coming from uh, Mexico and with more calves, there needs to be more hands. So he asked me, Hey, will you be interested to get on to my feed yard and start to, to learn to be a cowboy? It was like, heck yeah, I'd like to do that. And <laughs> yeah, that's how like the cowboy part started. Wow. Interesting. So, okay. To summarize, it sounds like you were looking to launch a certain type of business exporting beef from us to China. Yeah. And, and that, that kind of didn't work out, but then I was thinking, well, cause one of my minors is in undergrad with yeah. media strategies, but for, uh, you're probably aware of this too, like for foreigners, foreign students yes. that would want to work in industries, their major has to be aligned with whatever they study right. uh, in school. So for me, like if I directly enter the industry. You mean your I, industry work needs to be aligned with your school work right. in order to secure a visa. Right. So like to some extent it would be illegal. So like to me, like over there at the feed yard, more than 50% was, uh, well, there, there were, plenty of times, like more than 50% of the time yeah. that my job was to create media content. Right. So the rest of the time I spent over there, just, you know, learn how to, you know, be a cowboy and do cowboy stuff. Yeah. Okay. I see. So we can go down so many different paths because you're, you're really one of a kind, I feel right. So uh, in your surroundings, are there many other, so I assume there are other students coming from China in your school as well. Mm -hmm. Does any of them command a Southern accent? Does any of them want to become a cowboy or is currently a cowboy? Not that I know of. I've heard that yeah. there were maybe a few Asian kids that may wear cowboy hats and cowboy boots, that kind of stuff. But there's a chance that the source where I heard that kind of stuff, okay. which is a gas station, you know, cause I go in there and buy cigarettes and stuff. There's yeah. a chance that they may, uh, the staff members who work over there, like they probably couldn't remember my face. Uh, yeah. and, and then when I showed up with a different cowboy hat or a different outfit, and they might mistake me as another person. But the reality was that it was the same person. Like it was always me going in there buying cigarettes. Oh, you're saying you hear from other people that there are also other Asians wearing cowboy hat and wearing cowboy outfit, but actually it's just the one person, which is you. That's yeah, what you're saying. Yeah, yeah. Like, and I, I mean, overall on campus, well, 
because of the pandemic, I haven't been, I haven't been on campus very, very often, but overall on campus, there are just probably maybe a dozen of students who would wear cowboy hats on campus regardless right. of race. Right. So, so okay. Like, I see. So to me, I think the adoption of an accent, the adoption of your outfit, right? That's part of embracing a new identity. So what part of this Southern persona do you identify with? Which parts do you see the most of yourself in? Are you most comfortable about? What about it is most attractive to you? I think the accents, say compared to, in, in terms of phonology, right? Like say the standard American accent, when y'all speak, the uh, distances between each syllabus, they're kind of even which is not a bad thing because that kind of optimize clarity yeah. in, in communication, right? Like right. every word y'all say is clear. Right. Uh, for, for Southern accent, like there are distortions in pronunciation, especially vowels. Right. And, but, but like say those distortions of sounds are kind of, you know, like weirdly attractive to me so like th this different rhythm of right. the same language it kind of really attract well it's still attracting me and okay i'm very inclined to folks who have southern accents especially especially on the internet okay B besides mandarin do you speak any other dialects in china well i mean yeah i speak local dialect you yeah, know, which is, which language do you speak? I mean, we, which is the same as Mandarin, but I mean, it, it's the same as what Southern accents would do to, you know, like. Oh, you know, I see. They're, like, I see. They're, they're distortions of pronunciations, man, it comes down to. Is there any kind of similarity in that variant of Mandarin to your Southern variant of English or no? I think like say empir empirical support, meaning that someone has done a research and say hey like in terms of phonology local dialect in my hometown sounds similar to southern accents here in the states i don't think anybody has done any work that proves that but personally and i've also seen some of the comments because i'm on billability too you know which is you know, a chinese video based video based uh Billy Billy, yes so like I'm on there too, and I think there's some people from the same part of China where I came from. They commented on a few videos I made and said there are actually similarities, like between how local dialect sounds in my hometown okay. uh, and southern accents, which I kind of you know agree to, okay. to some extent. I mean, yeah, to to some extent. So what's interesting about accents is that obviously in China, in different parts of the country, people also speak Mandarin with a very different accent. Mm -hmm. And I think that sometimes people adopt different accents to assimilate into a local culture. For example, I grew up in Wuhan. And then when I moved to... Oh, you are. Yes, yes. But when I moved to Shenzhen, I learned to speak Cantonese. And then my Mandarin is sort of a mixed version of Cantonese person speaking uh Mandarin and Wuhanese speak person speaking Mandarin. And we'll get to that when we speak Mandarin later. But I feel when I started speaking Mandarin in the Cantonese voice, I felt cooler, to be honest. Now I come to think of it. Just because, I mean, growing up in the 90s, hmm. you know, the pop culture from Hong Kong and Taiwan are all the rage. So I'm about 10 years, more than 10 years. Well, actually, it's less than 10 years older than you. Hmm. So I think now the cultural trend has sort of reversed. I know that Taiwanese people are watching Aichiyi, for example. Aichiyi is one of the bigger uh, TV stations or TV, I guess, outlets, right? Internet TV outlets in Taiwan. And I think when you say Nedi Nan Ge Shou or Nedi Nu Ge Shou, it actually sounds pretty cool now. But back then, that was not how it was. And I think that when I adopted the local accent, I just felt a little bit cooler. It was an immature but natural thing to do. So I'm really curious, when you said this Southern accent is very attractive to you, what outside of the sound of it 
about say southern culture appeals to you is it the people is it hospitality i'm throwing various stereotypes out now right is it the cowboy culture is it the western western movies i don't know so tell me more about that oh that that's a good question i, I think well the major thing that southern cultures overall appear to be you know attractive to me like one of the reasons would be that earthiness and humbleness and sometimes you know like uh backwardness okay that, that all create something that's relatable to what china was when i was a kid right? okay okay and so uh say there there, there are many similarities between how people like value life in say maybe rural China, right? Their, their value system, like what they cherish as they move along with their career and family. And they're kind of similar to what Southerners or at least say some Southerners right, right. here in the States, what they value in life when it comes down to career, marriage, and blah, blah, blah. Right, so that right. kind of, uh, even though it's two different cultures, the innate qualities of some Southerners who stick with their own culture, yeah, and that helps me to, to ease my thought when it comes down to, say, perceive America as something like a home. Okay. So if I may paraphrase, it sounds like the cowboy culture, to use your word, there's a certain kind of backwardness or a certain kind of nostalgia bringing you back to the good old days yes. that you cherish. In terms of perception, right? like to some extent, I mean, rural America compared to urban America, yes, they're very behind in, in many areas. In that sense, uh, that kind of eased my nervous mind at the time, you know, and, and well, actually, and even like say before I learned the accent, before I transformed my, myself into a cowboy, I actually didn't like America much. Right? Okay. I wanted to leave here bad. Right? Wait, what year was this? Hmm? What year was this? Oh, that was in 2015. Right? So I started okay. to learn the accent at the end of 2015. But prior to that, like, or more precisely, like before, before the summer, yeah, I, all I was thinking about just was how I could leave this country. Right? Hold on, you came to this country in 2011, right? Because you said you've been here for 10 years? 20, at the very beginning of 2012. 2012, okay. And then from 2012, 2015, you were an undergrad somewhere? Or you were... I was, so from 2012 yeah. uh, to 2014, I was in Oklahoma. All right. Attending a much smaller university. Right. Back then, I was an engineering kid, so I was thinking, well, mostly my parents was thinking, well, you probably need to go to a bigger university with a bigger right. name, that typical Chinese yes. thing of education, right? So, yep. like, then I transferred to Texas Tech. After being here for one semester, I, I was thinking, well... This, you want this, nothing to do with engineering. Yeah, this thing ain't going to work. I, I hate it. And I didn't like it over here either. So uh, I was thinking about how I could leave America. Then I had the surgery, spent a few days in a hospital where it was all silent. Um, yeah. But hold on, what did you not like about America at that point that prompted you to want to leave? Well, I just felt like there are certain aspects of, who well, I'd say like any developed economy that are still backwards. Right? And Texas, usually the stereotypical image of Texas, you, you have that ostentatious desire of local people, you know, say, hey, we're proud of our culture. I mean, on one hand, it, 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 it's good, and it is something that to be proud of. But on the other hand, it's very annoying. Right? And as a dang foreigner at the time, I just didn't like it. Okay, okay. Are you sort of referring to the exclusivity, borderline xenophobia of the locals 
and as not, a foreigner, not, it didn't not, feel not blended. Really. Not, not really. I think it was more something more internalized inside of myself that did not want to make friends with, say, locals. And that was a problem because, like, even say in Oklahoma, I spent most of my time with other international students from other countries. Were you friends with Chinese people too? Or were you friends with mostly non Chinese international students? In Oklahoma, most international students in Texas, when I first came here for the first like year or two, like mostly African friends. Because back then, I, well, I mean, like right now, I, there were days I was still thinking about going to Africa. Plus, I, I, I was learning some French and I wanted to practice my French. And West Africa, like there are some countries where people speak French. Yeah. Uh, and one of my best friends back in Oklahoma, like he was from Africa, okay. Ivory Coast. Hey, okay. Ivory Coast more precise. So when I came to Texas, I was looking for Africans to, you know, hang out with. Right. Oh, I see. Okay, got it. All right. So to continue the story, you had your surgery, you were in the hospital and all was quiet. And did you have a change of mind somehow? Yeah. About reintegrating? Yeah, sure. Yeah, because, I mean, let's be frank. Like most people, when they go to another society, their views on the other society are often very judgmental. Yeah. Right? Like for some people that came to the States, they probably would not appreciate the way of life over here, even though, well, they're here. And I mean, it's the same thing in China. You've seen, you've probably seen some of the foreigners in China, they drink beer and bitch about China all the time, but they, you know, mm -hmm. have jobs and get paid in China. Uh, so right. I think we all have that inclination to be uh, very critical and judgmental right towards another group of people that that's I, I think like cognitionally we we, we can't help human nature yeah no we can't help you that but then during that time in a hospital i realized hey that's that's a mistake so at that point you didn't have a southern accent right you were speaking like a regular american no i was speaking like uh international student right with a chinese accent uh, probably not too much but right but still you would be able to hear but then in a hospital, I realized that I, I, I couldn't use my point of view as a whole yeah. to judge a society that I didn't even know of. So right. from that point on, I changed my major, switched from engineering to interdisciplinary studies, where that connection with other foreign students was just suddenly cut off. And right. in my classroom, most of my classmates became Americans. Okay. And for some, they were like me, who was ready to, you know, give up on the idea of, say, obtaining a college degree. But they eventually lured back in by the university and say, hey, like, well, you can put different things together and we'll give you a degree. So, yeah, that was the case for some of my classmates. Right. And, and that shift uh, of educational environment also helped me to integrate later on okay awesome so are your parents aware of this transformation in you and what about your maybe let's say your friends back home or maybe some chinese friends that you've made here in the u.s when they see this change in you in terms of outfit in terms of accent and persona what what was their reaction I think like most people, regardless of say culture group, right? Most people, they actually endure what I did, this transformation, right? Most people endure that, but- uh, You mean they endorse it? Like they encourage it? Yeah. Like they, they like the change. They okay. like seeing what, what they saw. Right. Uh, for, there's always like a few individual, like say a small percentage, of the population was say, hey, what the heck, what the heck did you do, right? You right. should stick with who you should be, like in terms of whatever yeah. your culture, identity, whatever. Yeah. Okay. Well, so I don't know if you pay attention to 
the uh, mainstream media these days, but a big part of our cultural and political discourse is race in America. It actually takes up tons of the attention and bring cycles of people in this country every single day. So you are a person immigrating from China, landing your feet in Oklahoma. I mean, I still hold a Chinese passport, so. Passport, okay, okay. So you are, you're, right. So you're in transition. Yeah. We're all tourists in this world, Bruce. <laughs> but my question to you is, what are some unpleasant experiences you've encountered? on the account of you being a Chinese cowboy or on account of you being a Chinese person to begin with, and then Chinese cowboy. And then a follow-up question to that would be, what are your thoughts on the discussion of race in general, perhaps focusing on Chinese Americans in this country? Okay. So beginning with your personal experience, any kind of unpleasant encounters as a Chinese person or Chinese cowboy? Okay, so for that, as a Chinese, foreign, foreign Chinese here in Texas, like, very unpleasant experience. I say almost close to none. All right. There, there are instances where folks might appear to be, you know, racism, right? But yes. the thing is, there are still a lot of people out there who never had the exposure to folks who are not like them. Correct. Right? So some of the, the uh, racism that I encountered it's not really out of, say, bad intention, right? And right. say, like, they purposely say something in order, in order to offend me. Like, right. That happens, like, very, very rarely. And often you can't even tell, like, are, right. are they being racist or are they just, you know, having a bad day and, yeah. and, and turn their shit on you, right? Like, you don't know. Right. You don't know. So, like, it's kind of hard to tell. Right, that that's as a Chinese, right? But as a cowboy, like from local people, bad interactions, also close to zero. The weird thing is, there are probably like one or two interactions that that I had with other Chinese people. Like they were not in favor of seeing me as a cowboy, right? And they, and they would. You know, kind of. And why is that? Is it because of the negative stereotypes of cowboys? Is it just because they just think it's weird? There might be like multiple reasons, like you know, whether they think me being weird, which I am. Right, of course. But, like, but I mean, I think that that's okay. Everybody's weird to some extent, right? Yeah. Uh, but I think maybe there, there comes with a certain level of jealousy, right? Uh, and what else would that be? Right, but they can't command a smooth southern accent and mingle with the cowboys. I'm right. just and, saying. And just maybe some other internalized reasons that yeah. make them perceive me as not pleasing. Right. I was listening to a semi-interview of you. It's mostly you giving a monologue on OAN, Our American Network. And one of the things you said really struck with me, and that is you consider your presence in Texas sort of being in parallel with your experience in Kunming because your tribe, right, the cowboys are sort of this uh, hillbilly surrounded by mountains. I, I think I'm paraphrasing your words, but you did use the word hillbilly. And you mentioned that this is a part of the country, this vast country with rapid economic development, where this is one part that's sort of constant and staying behind. It's certainly fallen behind in terms of economic growth. And you sort of feel the same way with Kunmi, right? So can you elaborate on this? Well, first of all, did I do justice to your monologue? And second, can you elaborate on this point? Yeah, I mean, you're pretty much on point, like, you know, we we border with other countries, and it's like what Texas has to deal with. Like the illegal immigrants in China actually came through my home province, right? like usually from Vietnam or, or Laos, because right now Chinese factories are having problem recruiting workers, right? Because they have problems hiring. 
Well, like, like even though they raise their salaries and improve the working conditions, like over there, but nobody wants to work in the factory. So, okay, uh, there are people in Vietnam and people in Laos. Yeah, yeah, probably uh, Gambo Cambodia too. Like they, they would go to China to work, and a lot of time, well, so at least sometimes, right, enter the country illegally. And okay. where, where would they enter? And that would be my hometown, where those elephants were running around, right? So, right. Were there literally elephants where you live? <laughs> Wild elephants. Right, right, right. But I've never seen them. You know, I've, okay. I've never seen them. All right. In the urbanity of Kunming, elephants don't just roam around on the street. No, no. It, yeah, it's yeah. like Texas. Like, we don't ride a horse to go to school or get our grocers. I mean, in some smaller Towns in, in right. Well, I mean, I know Texan politicians that ride horses to go vote. <laughs> yeah, that's just show. That's just, I mean, okay. politics All right. overall, it's stupid. Uh, okay. But this analogy of my hometown and, and Texas, yeah, it does help me to kind of ease into the integration here in, in the southern parts of the state. Yeah. And uh, like uh, also say, Texas has a lot of drug problems, right? Okay. And same thing in Yunnan. When I was growing up, man, drug problem was severe. And like right now, it's probably, right now it's a whole lot better. But when I was growing up, yeah. Did that have a lot to do with illegal immigration, cross-border activities? That, that was one thing. And another thing was there was this uh, triangle between China and Myanmar, Vietnam, right? Okay. And those places became, when it comes down to jurisdiction, right? It, like those places become heaven for, for criminals or international drug cartels. Because okay. like each country, sometimes it's confusing, like where should I enforce my law? Okay. Uh, so like those places became a hotbed for farmers to grow crops that would eventually be turning into drugs. Okay. Uh, but like right now, right now it has improved a lot. Okay. All right. Why don't we speak a little Mandarin? I'd love to see a Chinese cowboy speak Mandarin. Oh, <laughs> oh, <laughs> oh,我想问一下,你现在作为一个这个中国牛仔,你的下一步计划是什么?你现在还要完成你的学业吗? 你有什么这个去找工作的打算吗 文化可能不一样，种族可能不一样，但是它很多的发展规律它是相同的，它是相同的。所以说是，呃，就但但但如果说有些时候被采访，就主要是牛仔这一块，但是我更感兴趣的是社会社会科学这一块，对不对？它它
啊身份冲突，因为佛教它最大的一块就是说的啊要去除这种自我的观念，自我的观念，对不对？嗯、啊，因为就是说是从社会科学的数据上来说，确实种族和身份是个很大的一个问题，是个很大的一个问题。但是从佛教这个层面上来说的话，啊，你这个身份问题它本来就是。空无虚有的这么这么一个东西，啊啊，但但是的话，等我开始就是说是做这方面关于口音这方面的，呃，学术研究，就发现，哎，实际上，首先语言，很多学者认为这个语言的话，它是最重要的一个呃身份的一个怎么说呢？一一个一个 dimension， 嗯嗯，最最它它是最维度。呃，最最重要的一个维度，最重身，它是身份一个最重要的维度。然后，口音的话呢，作为这个很重要的维度当中，呃，就说是也很重要的这么一个成分。对对对，<笑>你刚刚说你自己的身份的冲突，指的是你作为一个华人，然后变成了牛呃长有了这个牛仔的身份的以后的这个冲突吗？还是指什么其他方面冲突？有有这个冲突，有这个冲突。对，但是我不明白的是，你刚刚说，因为你变牛仔的这件事情的话，其实，在你的家人还有周围的朋友，绝大部分都是非常欣赏和赞同的。那所以这里面的冲突指的是什么样的冲突？内心的冲突啊，内心冲突。哎，我是到底是中国人还是美国人，对不对？对啊，我是中国人还是还是还是这个美国南方人？中国南方人还是美国南方人？就说是他这个。文化，我自身的文化识别，特别在学语学口音的时候，但是文化识别这个冲突是有一段时间很强烈的嘛，就是、说是哎，到底是怎么回事？情，对不对？我感觉可能有些媒体觉得我比较新新奇，很大一个程度分成分就是说是很多人他在学习语言的时候，他就说是没有学到那个程度，就是说哎，我这个身份身份认认认同出现混乱。对对哦，还是有些人他他学的比较好， yeah. 呃，学的学语言学到比较好，到了一个程度的话，呃，如果再好，他就开始出现身份危机，对对 ？OK， 呃，就包括甚甚至在在香港的，呃，说说英语，呃、香港说说这个，像有很多人说英语嘛，对不对？对、yeah. ，他有些人他是刻意的，他不去要说英语，带英音的这种说英语，他非要有那个香、oh. 香港广东话那种。英文口音为什么？他是他是对于他来说的话，是作为一种文化文化归属感感的一种一种标识啊。嗯，那可能像我这样的人呢，就是、说是这个一股脑的就就就就把那个呃就把那个度给他超掉了，就是、说是就是、说是在学学语言学到一定程度，觉得哎，这个我会不会丢掉身身份这个问题，是吧？呃，就就把这个问问题的这个界限给它跨过去掉，啊、呃，可能是可能是这方面以来的话，就让让一些媒体觉得，哎，好像这个呃这这这个中二这个这个小孩还是还是值得值得探究一下，对不对？对，我觉得这里面其实很大的问题可能是社交圈，也就是说，你有没有会接受你？愿意跟你做朋友的这些人，假如说你做牛仔的话，有一群牛仔的朋友；然后你回云南的话，回昆明也有一群昆明的人，也觉得你是他们的一份子的话，嗯，那我觉得可能就不会有 crisis。这个 crisis 我觉得来源就在于你不，你有可能以某一种身份出现，不会被以那个身份为代表的群体所接受，这就是比较痛苦的。更多的，更多的是一种自身的一种恐惧吧，就是说是，哎，我这个对。口音学口口音学太好，会不会就说明哎，这个、呃、中国人的身份就丢掉了，对不对？啊，我我所以说说是我可能可能更多是这种，属于这种恐惧。但是，但是另一方面来说的话，你看我在这边的朋友，我看你这个提的问题当中，呃，其中有一个就是说是我的这个社交圈有多少中国朋友？啊、呃，基本上是没有。对对对 ，Yeah， actually let's switch back. Back to English. So I'm really curious. Tell me about your friends. Maybe in the cowboy circle, what do you do together? How did you make those friends? And、um, are you an insider now? Are you one of the boys? Like, what's going on? Mostly, mostly. I, I'm assuming they're most mostly met. But go ahead. 
you know, mo mostly through work and mostly men. I mean, there there are a few cowgirls that yeah. I know and right. who uh, I've befriended with. Uh, yeah, but like mostly men. But I know these cowboys mostly through work and and plus. And like, when you say work, you're talking about cowboy work. Cowboy work like, and, and also uh, media work. Right, like, like I said, I right, produce right. media content for the video work, and there are okay. lots of times where I need to get out of the yard. Well, well, I noticed you have an Instagram page and you have a YouTube channel. Where else do you put out your content now? Uh, nothing. <laughs> okay. I, so I, mostly I'm, these two. I, I'm busy writing papers and stuff, but I mean, there's a video of a cowboy sheriff that yes. I, I, I did, and well, I mean, the the video is like 95% ready. Uh, there are like small things that I, I need to fix, but yeah. well, in the next few days, I, I, I start to put it out there. Yeah, okay. but the media part of my job leads me to, you know, be friend with other folks in the cattle industry. And I think like in terms of cognition, right, like, uh, maybe we tend to be friends with those who either look like us or sound like us. Right? Right. But once you break through that barrier in yeah. your own mind, and you kind of, you know, like talk yourself through and, and right. say, hey, whatever you're trying to judge the person with, right? Like right. what are the stereotypes? That's not right. Get to know that person at a personal level, at an right. individual level, right? right. Once you... You have that in mind, man. You break that cognitive barrier in your own mind and say, hey, like I should be friends with those who, who are like me. You will start to realize, hey, people are people, right? Regard regardless of race, colors, whatever. Yeah, I mean, genetically speaking, that's also true too. Like regardless of race or genetic differences are very, very small to the point we can almost ignore that difference. Uh, so, okay, that's interesting. And that acceptance to the other group of people, at least here in West Texas, uh, in West Texas at least here, I think that's mutual, right? Like they, they see you having the interest to get to know them. There, there's like no solid reason for them to turn you away. So let me ask you this, right? So you're preaching tolerance and you're saying that you have met genuinely hospitable cowboys that are interested in getting to know you and accepting you into their tribe, right? How tolerant are they of, so first of all, I assume a lot of cowboys are also have, there's a religious component, they're Christ followers, right? But how accepting are they of the following types of people? So people that are pro-choice, for example, right? I think abortion is totally fine. And then they're also transgender individuals, for example, right? What are their thoughts on people that embrace New York values or Wall Street values, for instance? The coastal elites, for example. I'm really curious, you know, what their perspectives are on these groups of people that seem dramatically different, much more different in a way than a Chinese cowboy, actually, to them. What you just said right there, I think is what really divides urban America and rural America at an ideological level, right? And most cowboys, yes, they do have conservative values. I mean, there are ones who have liberal values too, but by large, they have conservative values. Right. Uh, from my experience, if you try to get to know them and lay down your judgment, negative judgment towards anyone uh, and they would accept you at a personal level regardless of what you believe right like for example i'm not a christian right like i don't uh i mean i do go to church and i have christian friends right. uh, and i i even like you know participate in some of their their services and stuff yeah and also when i learned the accent Southern preachers who put their content on YouTube were a large source of my learning material for learning the accents. Okay. Uh, but like religiously speaking, I'm more like a religious. And okay. in terms of life philosophy, I lean more towards Buddhism. Uh, so like that's a huge difference between me and the rest of the cowboys. Right. But that 
it's not a dividing line that stops me from being part of their life and vice versa. Like you said, America focuses more, the mainstream media focuses more on race, you know, whatever. But, and, and from a research standpoint, that's probably what needs to be focused on, right? But say from a personal level and from the philosophical thought of how Buddhism perceives self, right? then that's probably not the right thing to look at. Okay. Yeah, I feel there's the Twitter America and there's the real life America. And Twitter America, there's a lot of clash of ideologies. People are almost coming up with invisible enemies. And the mainstream media, there's in mainstream media, there's a lot of fear mongering and invention of the boogeyman, right? But I think in real life America, a lot of people don't actually fall under those stereotypes portrayed by uh, these intellectual elites or authoritative resources or author authoritative sources. It's not only the fault of media, that's our fault because communication is mutual, right? Like, uh, the media is the way it is right now because of the way we are right now. Because uh, uh, whatever fear or bad things, those are types of things that captivate our attentions. Yeah. Uh, and, and like, again, cognitively, that's how our brains function. We love bad news. We love things that threaten our existence. That's why the news is the way it is, right? Because of the way we are. Right? Like, we, we love bad things. If the news is all about positivity, then hardly ever it will get any views. Understood. It's, it's not just the media, because, well, I, I study media. Media is part of it, but by large, it's also the audience. Like, we're not conscious of what we want to feed ourselves with right like yeah. for example like social media like a lot of people they just get on like get on social media without knowing that they want it to be on there right. right like we're not modern education is not good at many things and one of those things is we're not good at tuning ourselves to listening to our true voices. Right? Like we have our TV on, our cell phones, all kinds of screens that constantly demands our, our attention. But what we need to remember is that our bodies still stay relatively similar to how a human body would function 10, 20,000 years ago, when maybe we were just swimming around on the great plain of Africa right so like our minds are not equipped with the same level of consciousness that's able to deal with what technologies especially you know communication technologies media is trying to do to us right intentionally and unintentionally yeah so the fact that the human body hasn't really caught up with technological progress the right. fact that these uh, weapons of media destruction, if you will, are coming back to hurt the, the, the masters that invented them. Do you think there's an element of being a cowboy that sort of keeps you grounded? That sort of helps you feel that you are holding on to certain lifestyle choices that would uh, make you impervious to those types of influences? No. No. I mean... Okay. Uh, what keeps me grounded, again, it's, it's more about what I read. And again, some of the Buddhist philosophies, like, you know, without the deities and, and stuff like that. Yeah. Uh, Buddhist philosophies and what I read scientifically right, for research. So those types of things are what keeps me grounded. I, I, I think like being a cowboy, it, there are aspects, some aspects that do help me improve my own life quality, right? And, and kind of let myself know who I am 
and what I am better. But cowboy to his core, uh, it's yeah. both the culture and a job. Uh, like right. anybody can integrate into this culture and anybody can do this job, right? As long as they want to. So what is your plan for after the PhD? And how do you think this cowboy persona will help you progress in the things that you'll do in the future? Well, I, I think the cowboy token in me, I think is more of a human experience, like within myself, right? And at least for now, it is kind of in terms of accent, right? It is leading me to do research that would help us to connect with technologies better, right? Because, I mean, there are research that, that shows kids would play with other kids who sound like them rather than who look like, like them. And that's how powerful accents are or voice in general, right? And there are also research in Europe that shows people would categorize others uh, into different ethnic groups, not based on their look, but based on their accents. Right. Again, that shows how voice, how, how powerful voice is and how accents can be revealing and at the same time confusing. Right. So like oh. me, it's a great example of a walking cognitive dissonance uh, on campus or or maybe on the internet too. Yeah. Look, that and th this dissonance is not necessarily in me, right? Because for me, when I switch when I switch between Southern accent and Mandarin as I talk to myself, you know, in these two languages. I feel like I'm still me. There's like no change. I, I'm still Bruce. And yeah. there's no such thing as shifting of personas. Maybe a little bit, but not as strong as what other people perceive. But when I switch between Southern accent and Mandarin, as I communicate with someone else verbally, that blew their mind. <laughs> and like at first I couldn't understand that. But then, uh, Again, as accents are very powerful auditory cues, right? As we, we, we communicate with each other, it, it contains a lot of meanings that I didn't realize. Yeah, so like, again, the dissonance within myself isn't much, like in terms of the conflicts between the, the two personas, as some people would say, one being Chinese and one being cowboy. But for others who perceive me, right, and, and that is a big cognitive dissonance. Right? Yeah. Do you ever see yourself taking on another identity sometime down the road? Uh, what, what, what identity? Oh, I'm saying, do you see yourself taking on yet another persona, a different kind of identity? Yes. Yet I, another sort of... I am right now, actually. What do you mean? Like, well, being a PhD student, you're going to be a researcher. Oh, sure. Right. right, you're gonna be a researcher, and, and you're gonna train your brain differently in order to write research papers. And there are actually similarities between what a cowboy does and what a researcher does. Not in terms of what they do, but how they do things. Okay. But the two different uh, jobs would yield very different life perspectives. Uh, and, and say, being a researcher which is actually what I'm really interested in doing, I think that identity hasn't been seen by most people besides uh, my professors. Okay, okay. It, it was them who convinced me to say, hey, you probably need to do a PhD, which at the beginning, I didn't think of it was something possible for me because all I was thinking about, you know, being a cowboy. But then through the uh, work I do with media production, you know, taking pictures and looking up for statistics in agriculture and comparing social, like, development patterns between China and the United States, 
between urban and rural areas. And that's when I realized, hey, there's something uh, bigger than, say, being a cowboy. And that's actually also a driven force for me to be in the cattle industry. Towards the end of my master's program, I wanted to see, like, why sociologically, like, why people would hold on to their belief systems, right? like, why people would value certain things that others would regard as worthless. Yeah. So, like, th those are type of the things that really attracted me to be the cowboy. Yeah, it's interesting that earlier you said your accent or your traces of audio expression affects the way you think and aff affects the way you act. Because just now when we were switching to Mandarin, I felt that you were a different person. Yeah, I, I think mean, if, I were, if I were to cut up the audio and then show the Southern accented interview and the Mandarin interview, people would not have been able to tell us the same guy. The, the thing is, like, in, in communication, there's the sender and the receiver. You have your communication channel. And then you have your destination of the message. And symmetrically speaking, then there's the information source, right? So the information source, in this case, I am the information source, right? Like for me, I do not feel there's a disconnection between the Chinese me and the cowboy me. You do then, not see the difference. Right. Okay. But then language, language contains lots of codes of social norms and yes. culture, right? right? So in this case, language is, well, I'm going to put it this way. I can say, whatever I want to say is coded in language, which has another meaning because uh, of the, the, the culture that. that yes, goes yes, yes. Right? Because of the background. Right. Yeah. So, so like whenever people decode the information in their brains, like right. it, it becomes confusing. Like it becomes like a, it's, it's yeah. just like two, two different people while the reality is there's only one me. I'll give you a quick example of where I see the difference. When you were talking about your next plans, when you were speaking Mandarin and you're saying, I mean, so that's very different from when you were talking about how you were really interested in doing research in English, right? The, the reason is because to me, and this is sort of a stereotype, but the fact that somebody wants to do a PhD as a Chinese person coming to America, that seems very normal. It just seems like the next logical step. Going to grad school is no big deal. It's like, it's like deciding what to eat for dinner, right? Mm -hmm. And I'm trivializing this a little bit, but it's definitely not a it's not a major life decision, it seems, right? So the way you say it, right? It's a du po ma, as in, I mean, what else am I going to do, right? But when you say it in English, you're like, I'm going to do a PhD, and I'm really interested in doing this research about how accents can have serious implications about why people hold on to certain values that others consider worthless. Mm -hmm. That really shows that you regard this as a serious and deep-seated decision. You see, and I don't know if it's because you think differently when speaking those two different languages or me listening differently or hearing them differently as the receiver, because the, the norm I perceive from someone saying tu fu ma is like, yeah, I mean, just do it, right? No big deal, <laughs> right? I mean, whether you're serious about it or not, it just, if you want to stay in America, of course you have to do it, right? But then when you try to, when you speak English and express your interest in doing research, uh, telling, talking about your PhD plans, I take it more as, wow, this part, as the cultural norm of Americans having made up their mind about devoting the next four or five years of their lives into this one academic discipline. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's the one uh, differential I, I, uh, I noticed. The thing is, like, I'm not going to argue with you because <laughs> what you're experiencing is the result of your cognitive process that leads you to think there are two different people, right? There are two different personas. Yeah. And the thing is, it also took me, like, uh, me and my family, mentally and psychologically, uh, psych psychologically, a lot to eventually, you know, 
come to the point where it maybe I should be trying to get back to school and continue to be educated, eventually receive, hopefully, you know, eventually receive my PhD degree. Yeah, so I think, uh, well, again, I'm not going to argue with you because <laughs> what you experience cognitively, I go through the same thing too. Because I can't yeah. give you, the example would be, like, say, my Mexican American friends, right? You know, one of them, well, I have one of my best friends, he's Mexican American. When he speaks English and when he speaks Spanish, to right. me, two different people. Right. Like, I, I, just, I just couldn't comprehend the reality that he just changed into a different person. As he switched his language, uh, languages, yeah. but him uh, as a person, he's still him. He doesn't change as the information source. He doesn't change as who he is. But us as the receiver, the destination of information, how we interpret things, right? and that made us think. It's two different people while it's the same person. Understood. Well, awesome, Bruce. It's been great having you on the show. It's been a really unique conversation. Thanks for giving us your time. Same here. And uh, like I said, like I, I like what I like seeing what you did on Twitter and what you uh, put it out there. You know, content wise, I, I think like nowadays whether it's mainstream media, you know, focusing about race or yeah. entities or whatever, or entertainment, which is pretty much exclusively about booties and, and money. And like having seen somebody who's willing to put in the work and effort right, to produce something, at least from my standpoint, something at a sociological level that would benefit a society. I, I think that that takes a lot. Oh, thank you. Thank you. I mean, I think it's only possible with interesting conversations with interesting guests. Yes, sir. So and thanks for being part of that. Even for the uh, Chinese content that you put out, out there, whenever I read the screenshots that you had on your Twitter yeah. account, right. it was massive. Well, I assume, you know, poetry. It was like, well, this guy reads. And I like people who read. Great, great. Always good to have a fan. <laughs> <laughs>